In this video, I'm going to talk about how coronavirus fear porn will make you sick. Notice what the psychologist says in Psychology Today. Fear! Media, fear, and the coronavirus outbreak. The relentless barrage of coronavirus news, all of which is scary, or the vast, vast majority is very scary, may raise your anxiety level. So anxiety means that you're flaming up. The anxiety is just a word that describes a symptom, you know, a mental symptom, an emotional state, a mental state. But the biological equivalent is an uptick in inflammation. So we don't want to have undue anxiety about any condition at all. So if you go to Forbes, they give a positive spin, despite the fear mongering. We will overcome this. We will overcome this. Well, what is the battle to overcome this? Well, when you have a picture like this of young kids, and you know, I mean, nothing is more catastrophic for a parent than to have their child become deathly ill. So you have these young, cute kids, and you know, the, the idea is, oh, we, we don't want them to get sick, and of course, nobody does. But when you look at this and you see the mass, and, and, and then if you were to, to visualize a really terrible viral outbreak that rapidly runs through a population and kills lots of people, well, that never has happened uh, in America. And maybe the last time would have been like probably bubonic plague type, type stuff, maybe Spanish flu-like stuff, maybe. I don't even know for sure. But I do know this much. I do know this much that there are endless movies that you can binge watch. So the best 58 pandemic movies to binge watch while you're in quarantine. Now, how dumb is that? While you're sitting there freaked out about dying from an infection based upon the fear mongering, we're going to go watch a movie like Outbreak where people literally die within a day or two of being exposed. So here is the movie. There is the monkey that came in from South America or Africa. It was infected, or Asia, wherever it was. I think it was Asia, where it was infected. And then uh, Rene, the Rene Russo character, you can see how young she is there because this was back in 95, so 25 years ago. So she was probably like 40 then. Uh, she, or maybe a little younger even, she's exposed to it on, on, on one day while she's in her, her hazmat-like suit. She's, she, she's, she's exposed in one day, and the next day she's in bed, and she's one of these. So here she is here. I think this may have been when she got exposed. And next thing you know, she's in bed. She's in bed and dying. So that's the image that people have when it comes to all of this stuff. And this is not a good place for your brain to be. And this was published back uh, in, in, on, on, on Bloomberg's site back in 2015. The author is, you can see, David Robeson. So to die, sometimes you need only believe that you are ill. And so as this author discovers, we can unwittingly catch such fears with often terrifying consequences. So beware of scaremongers. Like a witch doctor's spell, their words might be spreading modern plague. So here's the, uh, here's the uh, image that they gave us. The contagious thought that could kill you. And they show us hands. So when it comes to the coronavirus prevention that we all see, it does involve hands, actually. So here you can see, you can watch Sanjay Gupta teach you how to wash your hands properly. Remember, get plenty of soap. If you don't like Sanjay Gupta and your guy is Dr. Oz, well, he can show you too. Remember to add soap. Now, when these guys show you this hand washing, they're showing you how surgeons scrub up uh, and wash their hands like crazy before they go into surgery, which of course makes sense because they're going to be exposing, uh, they're going to be going inside of somebody. So it's a little bit different than you touching your face. Like, we touch our face 4,000 4, times a day or whatever it is. Oh my God, you're, you're going you're gonna to get the crone in your eyeballs. I mean, it's ridiculous. But this is how people are conditioned. And you have to think about this. How many people out there who do not wash their hands the way Oz and, and Gupta demonstrated uh, and are absolutely symptom-free despite, despite being infected by the virus. So when I say infected by the virus, it doesn't mean you're going to have symptoms. It just means that it's in you. And so it's in you, and you have no symptoms. And how many of them are out there? 
not washing their hands the way Osner. So, of course, we know there are, there are millions probably like that. Because we know that most of the people who get infected by this thing don't have symptoms. Only those who are, who are sick before they get infected. So we're going to talk about how your brain can screw you up. So it's called the nocebo effect. Now, the opposite of nocebo is placebo. And the way this works is uh, researchers will, uh, when they do their particularly double-blind trials, this means that the physicians don't know or the researchers don't know who's getting the active drug or treatment or the inactive drug or treatment. And so they, the term placebo is used to describe uh, uh, positive outcomes from, from an inactive treatment. So the opposite is nocebo. So in 109 double-blind trials involving over 1,200 healthy volunteers, 19% taking the, the inactive treatment called a placebo reported side effects. And those side effects were referred to as nocebo. Headaches led the list. But look what else. Drowsiness, weakness, nausea, nausea dizziness and fatigue. Some of those symptoms are associated with viral infections. You feel weak and nauseous and you think, you think flu, puking, but before you actually have flu symptoms, you get these symptoms, then you get the fever and in, in, in bed you go. So nocebo symptoms, remember negative symptoms, disease-like symptoms that, are, that, are, that occur after taking an inactive treatment and an active drug can give you symptoms of, of ill health, viral infection. Now, the term that's used, if you were to use the proper term, you just call it an acute phase response. An acute phase response is essentially the essentially flu-like symptoms. So you can get an acute phase response from the flu infection, coronavirus infection, or from taking nothing. If you, and, and this is the, the, the nocebo response. So they did a hypertension study. Those taking nothing had more side effects than those taking the drug. That should show you how powerful your, your mind is at either hurting or helping you, in this case, hurting us. Aspirin study. All took aspirin, but, but, they, but they warned uh, some of the subjects about the GI side effects, and the other subjects were not warned about the GI side effects. So they all took the drug, but those who were warned about GI side effects were three times more likely to have GI side effects than those who were not forewarned, once again showing you how powerful your mind can work in a negative direction. 34 college students were told that a subthreshold electrical current would pass through their heads during this experiment, and headaches are a common outcome. Well, they didn't put any current in there, they just had lights go on on a machine while they had electrodes attached to the head that were not plugged in. No current was used, but more than two-thirds developed headaches. That should tell you why it is so important to protect your brain from uh, scaremongering, fear-mongering people from any flavor persuasan. So this was a pub uh, an article published in the British Medical Journal back in 2006. Ted Kapchuk's a pretty famous guy who studies this stuff at Harvard, and in this in this, art, in this study, they looked at people with arm pain, persistent arm pain, and they gave them acupuncture or fake acupuncture, and you, they gave amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant that modulates serotonin and norepinephrine in the nervous system, in your brain and spinal cord, and... Uh, it can have pain-reducing effects as well as antidepressant effects. So they gave basically an inert pill. So a little pill made of nothing, active. Nothing active at all. That's the important thing. Nothing active at all. And they looked at placebo and nocebo effects. So this was the placebo effect. You can see this would be the acupuncture uh, sham. This would be the amitriptyline sham, the inert pill. And you can see where pain began, and this is after two weeks, and this is down at eight weeks. You can see how pain reduced in both. So this is a placebo response. They were given a, an, in, an, in, an, an inactive treatment, and they had a positive outcome. Well, an inactive treatment can give a negative outcome, too. So in this called, again, nocebo effects. So they really should have called it nocebo effects from taking an inactive treatment, because because the inactive treatment can give you the placebo or the nocebo response. All right, so the side effects, 
the types of side effects were totally different in the two groups. Remember, you had fake acupuncture and fake drug. And the, the, the side effects clearly mimicked the information given at informed consent. So we all sit down if we're in the study, and they say, okay, so here are some side effects of acupuncture, here are side effects of amitriptyline, and obviously you know you're, which one you're getting because you're either going to get the fake acupuncture or the fake amitriptyline, even though they didn't, they, they didn't know what they were getting. At two weeks, 25% of those getting fake acupuncture had one or more side effects. Nearly one-third of those taking the pill had uh, more than one side effects, one or more side effects. Now, here's the interesting thing, or, or where we enter the interesting part of this. No reported effect was serious, even though three participants withdrew from the study because the placebo pill gave them excessive fatigue or dry mouth from taking nothing, taking nothing. So here are the side effects from taking the inactive pill. So parentheses is percentage of people who uh, had drowsiness. So this is, the, this is the total number. So you can see drowsiness was the most common symptom and skin rash was the least common. But what I want you to look at down below is nausea, frequent urination, and skin rash. So these are uh, symptoms related to your uh, visceral system and skin, not just like aches and pains. So nightmares, anxiety, headache, dizziness, restlessness, dry mouth, and drowsiness from taking nothing. But you thought you were taking something that could give you these symptoms, and then your brain followed through and drove your body to give you these symptoms. So that is why you must protect yourself against scary language when they start talking about um, pandemics. So again, the movie Outbreak, this is what people visually see. Now, what did we see in the, our actual news back uh, in 2009? So this is from Reuters and from July 2009. New flu. This is the H1N1 virus. The H1N1 virus is unstoppable, says the World Health Organization, who calls for a vaccine. Unstoppable. Here they are, dressed in the Outbreak movie stuff scaring the average person who thinks they're going to get infected and die. Why? Because they watched Outbreak and other movies, and that is the, the, the mental conception that people have, and they have an associated emotional component, which is very flamey and very scary. So uh, how, who is out there promoting the scare? Well, now Fauci, when he writes articles in, in the New England Journal of Medicine, is very reasonable, but when he's in public... I don't think we should ever shake hands again. <laughs> How dramatic. How dramatic. How about this guy? Bill Gates, mass gatherings might not return until we get coronavirus vaccine. Well, what is, I didn't know Dr. Gates or Bill Gates was a doctor and understood about this. So more fear, fear, fear. And so you can go into various countries are, Newspapers in various countries are reporting on the fear-mongering that they are getting. I just showed you from the U.S., and U.S. politicians participate in this too, and you go over to Israel, and so this is, this is a, an Israeli newspaper, Haaretz, what do they tell us? Netanyahu's coronavirus fear-mongering is causing irreversible damage to the economy. Let's go up to Canada, and this is... Trudeau, who, if you look at his background, he has no education in biology whatsoever. Canada, unlikely to return to normal until there is a COVID-19 vaccine. Is he working for Bill Gates? Now, I'm not saying this as, I'm just saying it's just ridiculous. Ha. So, so, so Bill Gates, who is, 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 is not a scientist, and Trudeau, who's not a scientist, are both calling for vaccines, when in fact we know that most people who get exposed to corona do not have symptoms. So this is really, really problematic, problematic. And so I would not trust what politicians and bureaucrats say when it comes to something like this, when they characterize it the way it is characterized or portrayed in movies like Outbreak. So 
What's a politician? A person who acts in a manipulative and devious way to gain advancement within an organization. So this is what I think our conception should be of these people uh, because, well, pretty much, it's really kind of interesting. Uh, depending upon which way one, one views the political world, they trust their own guys, but they absolutely distrust the other. And so... But, but what that does t tell us all is that they still trust some, and I don't get how that could be because, because most of these guys simply do not tell, tell the truth. And they help to perpetuate the fear. So infecting people without symptoms might be driving the spread of coronavirus more than we realize. Really? Really? So healthy people. So let's take two healthy people right here, Courtney Cox, or I mean, I, I suspect that they're healthy, Courtney Cox and Obama. So... Uh, I'm really not worried about these guys spreading an infection. I'm much more worried about people who are sick and flamed up who cannot shed the virus properly and get rid of it quick enough. So uh, unless these people are going to be working in a nursing home or, or, or visiting sick people in a hospital, how, how are they ever going to be exposed to these people? Because you have to realize that if, if, if you look at the news now, coronavirus in the U.S. at least, I think it was up in New Jersey, it spread through a nursing home. Well, you know, you don't typically have young, healthy people running off the street after a nice jog and go breathe on sick people in a nursing home. So this is not characterized properly, and this is just a fear-inducing title that should, in my view, be ignored, or at least well, not ignored, but put in the proper context. And we also know that behind the scenes, uh, or not so, not so behind the scenes, we know that in general, disease is good business. And that means keeping diseases around, good business. Why is why Goldman Sachs asks, is curing patients a sustainable business model? So when you look at the news and you look at big banks and politicians, I just find it to be shocking that people so readily believe everything that these characters say. So this is how, or at least one way, for you to unfear yourself. So the first thing you need to know, now everyone knows about strep throat. So strep throat, streptococcus pyrogenes is the most common bacterial cause of sore throat. Now, what people don't understand is, or not everyone, I mean, lots of people, what lots of people don't understand is that strep is always in your throat. <laughs> Look, strep is part of the normal flora of the respiratory tract in many people, but does not cause a problem until the person's natural defenses to disease are compromised, and that means they have a flamey, a flamey event. So we already have the strep in us. Strep does not come into us from outside by walking in the cold. I was outside sledding, and I didn't wear a scarf or a hat, and I got wet, and I was having so much fun. I stayed out there for a long time. I come home, and the next thing you know, the next morning, I have a sore throat. Now, did I catch some strep that was on my, um, on my sled? No. I stress myself. I, I got cold, I stayed out there longer than I should, and then my, I flamed up, and that allowed my natural homeostatic relationship with strep in my body to be lost, and now strep pr proliferated, and now I have a, have a strep throat. It didn't come flying in for me f during, on, a, on a wave of air when the, when, when the wind blew while I was out sleigh riding. The reason why I gave that example is because most people can relate to something like that. So we know that there are more bacteria in the human body than there are human cells in the human body. And there are probably the same or close to, who knows, but trillions of viruses as well. And we know this because uh, there is, we have the human virome. So look at the title of this article, Describing the Silent Human Virome with an emphasis on giant viruses. So what do they tell us in this article? So a rough estimation, estimation based on bacteria infecting viruses, these are called bacteriophages, and these bacteriophages are on in the human body. This indicates that there are 100 times more viruses 
than eukaryotic cells in our body. Now, eukaryotic cells, that's us, that's human body. Prokaryotes are bacteria. So there are more viruses than there are human cells in the human body. And there is more bacterial cells in the human body than there are human cells. So we have more viruses and bacteria in the human body. What do we know about these human-associated viruses? They control the microbial diversity of the human gut and skin. So, and they actually help to keep these, the microbes under control. So these viruses are very important for us. We need viruses. So viruses affect the very foundation of our nature, our genome. So by me saying we need viruses in our body, that goes absolutely against what we're all told to fear them. Because remember, they come in, someone sneezes or farts, and we get exposed, we get bathed in viruses, and then all of a sudden we're really, really sick. Well, that suggests that viruses shouldn't be in the human body. And of course, they're part of us. And they make up approximately viral, you can see viral fragments, represent, make up 8% of our human genome. So that's very important to keep in mind. So this is the figure one from that article and what they're showing us. So this is your digestive system, respiratory system, circulation, skin. What is this? G. Yeah, I can't figure out. I'm missing up what this one is. Uh, genital urinary and nervous system. So green means documented viruses in these systems. And then purple, not documented. Now look at the different viruses. So viridae, so you think virus. So adenoviruses herpes viruses, look, as you can see, herpes viruses are in us. <laughs> it's not, you gotta catch them, they're in us. Down below here, where is it? Coronavirus, where do you find coronaviruses? In the human body. Now remember, that's, they called it novel, so it's not the same one that we have, but you can see we've got coronaviruses in our respiratory system. So wherever, and of course you can just pause and look at this, but wherever you see green, so you hear digestive viruses, respiratory viruses, circulatory viruses, skin viruses, genital urinary viruses, and nervous system viruses. All normal, all, all normal. So the idea that we should be afraid of these things needs to be put in obviously the proper context. It gives another picture. And so they show skin, nervous system, blood, digestive tract, respiratory tract, genital urinary tract, all the viruses that are there naturally. So this means that you should embrace your viruses. Now, how do you do this? Well, we do this by taking care of ourselves because the second that we start to abuse ourselves through poor lifestyle, not enough sleep, stressing, not enough activity, and eating all the wrong foods, we change our relationship with our bacteria and our viruses. And when we do this, we are much more likely to develop an unhealthy relationship with our own bacteria and viruses, uh, as well as ones that, novel ones that come in and affect us. So when we look at, this is the stats from Sweden, looking at as of April 20th, those who died, look who they were, the lion's share, 60 and older. Now you might say, well, why is it that there are more people dying who are 80 to 90 than 90 and older? Well, because there's more people who are 80 to 90 than 90 and older. So when you look at this, the older we are, the more frail we are, the more likely, likely we are to die from an infective event. Now people will say, what about these healthy people down here? They're young. Well, yeah, but you see the problem with healthy, the language healthy, it means different things to different people. People actually define it differently. I'll give you an example. A, 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 a friend of mine living in, who, who lives out in California, he's got rheumatoid arthritis, he's mid fifties, he's taking Humira, which helps to control his rheumatoid symptoms. A little overweight. Now the thing about uh, that you'll see in a little while, actually I'll get there in, in a couple of seconds and I'll show you how that works. So, but we can see, so these are sick people. So, so as you get older, you become more inflamed and if we eat unhealthy diets, then we're gonna screw up our homeostatic, our symbiotic relationship with our, with our natural bacteria and viruses and they can screw us up. They, the opportunistic ones can get out of control and participate in killing us independent of being exposed to a, an outside one like, like the novel coronavirus. 90% of those who die from virus uh, had other illnesses. So this is very, very well known by now. Almost 
of COVID-19 emissions involve comorbidities. Here they are, hypertension, obesity, chronic disease, diabetes, cardiovascular d- disease. And I'll give you a funny story in a little while, as I said before. So one of the biggest factors, obesity. So in this new uh, uh, New York Post article, age and obesity, the biggest risk factors for coronavirus. So uh, my, my friend is, takes Humira for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and he's overweight, and he, and he tried to go get a coronavirus test because you would think about someone who is taking Humira. Now, let me show you this. Remember, he's taking Humira. And if you're taking Humira, you're more at risk for infections, including tuberculosis, and infections caused by viruses. We'll just focus on viruses because that is the one. So, so he's overweight. He has rheumatoid arthritis. He's taking Humira, which inhibits tumor necrosis factor, which is needed to fight infection, so it depresses it below where it should be. These people are more likely to develop infections by viruses. So he had obesity, and he is taking a medication that predisposes him to viral infection, and he was denied a coronavirus test. So is he considered to be healthy? That's why you must be very careful with how you look at who is healthy or not healthy in these studies. And the average person, when you think healthy, you think about some young, lean, fit person who has no problems, and they're infected. Not so much. Uh, We know that that's not the case. What do we know? This came out from the New York Post just the other day, April 18th. America's junk food diet makes us even more vulnerable to coronavirus. Now, (laughs) when you look at this, so you can see you got a cheeseburger over here, but let's just say that all you were to do was eat what you see right here, and get rid of all this. Get rid of the fries, get rid of all this extra crazy ketchup, get rid of the bun, goodbye bun, and make a small beer, and throw a salad over here. Now, if you have a salad or vegetables over there, small beer, drink some water, and you have some meat, cheese, bacon, and a bunch of more vegetables, this is not a problem. So when you look at this, what you want to be looking at is the Intense amount of sugar in this amount of of, uh, ketchup, the white flour, and then the deep fried uh, white potato that we see here. That's the problem. Now, this was in the New York Post recently, and an MD was interviewed, and she said that, you know, the big problem is fat people with coronavirus, but, you know, know, we we have a problem talking about that because of the whole fat shaming thing that that, that is trending now. Well... These are the people who are more likely to get coronavirus. So that's what you should be afraid of. You should be afraid of these foods, overeating these foods. That's a reasonable fear, overeating these foods. And we know that these fears are being pushed upon us. Here is Krispy Kreme handing out uh, (laughs) these donuts to healthcare workers. Big problem, big problem. Why do we know this? Well, from the Daily Mail in UK, coronavirus will make us fatter. And we know that the fatter we are, the greater risk that we are at. So what should we be afraid of? Well, I would say avoid all the fear stuff. And if you are overweight, you can turn that around in no time at all. Just stop eating excess sugar, flour, refined oils, replace those calories, or not quite so much, obviously, because we overeat those calories, but but replace those foods with volumes of vegetation. And then then, then fatness goes away rapidly. Plus, all those foods are anti-inflammatory and they have a beneficial effect on modulating our immune functions so that we don't overreact to stuff. So what else can we do? Well, we can embrace the fact that we are already, and I put in quotes, air quotes, right? I'll do quotes right here. We are already, in quotes, infected by trillions of viruses. They become problematic when we flame up and we lose our ability to have a homeostatic symbiotic relationship with our bacteria and our viruses. We want to stop watching fear porn movies like this that create an inaccurate perception of what the coronavirus or any other virus has been. Remember, H1N1, they characterize it like this. They show people in hazmat type suits uh, working on the H1N1, this pandemic that's coming that never arrived. So we, we, should, we, should, we, we should not be watching this stuff. So what could you fill your brain with? Well, you can go online and you can listen to YouTube videos uh, about with information like As a Man Thinketh or get this book and read it. If you, if you don't, you can see how cheap this stuff is. You can do audiobooks even. I mean, it's cheap. 
So Kindle as well, 99 cents, nothing. As a man thinketh. So we got to get our, our, our thinking right. A great book. And also think about this, and how many people are losing money because they're not working because of this whole thing. Well, here's a great book, Think and Grow Rich. You can listen to Think and Grow Rich, uh, read to you or parts of it by uh, uh, Earl Nightingale. Earl Nightingale uh, was the biggest promoter of Napoleon Hill's work back in the, I forget, maybe 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And you can listen to Uncle Earl. He's got a great voice. And he will tell you, you got to get your brain right because negative thoughts will make you sick. So we want to put good thoughts into our head and then get ourselves deflamed as well. So how do we do this? Well, we want to not live in fear and lose sleep because sleep loss will increase inflammation. And we do not want to stress because, look at this, the inflammatory response is an integral part of the stress response. We want to avoid stress and we want to get the right food in our bodies and that is uh, the books that I write about. There are other books out there as well. Obviously, I like mine. So these are easy to pick up. You can cruise over to deflame.com, get the book. Uh, you can watch videos on the YouTube channel, and you can follow on Facebook as well.